Good afternoon. I am Norbert Claude Gorin from the Department of Hematology and Cell Therapy at Hôpital Saint Antoine in Paris. I am the chair also of the EBMT Global Committee. I am pleased and honored to be the moderator for this seminar dedicated to infections in hematology oncology, uh, unfortunately in the COVID era. This is my disclosure. Uh, as you can see, but I'm essentially pleased to mention that this webinar is supported by an unrestricted educational grant from Air in Space. We have three worldwide renowned speakers, and I'm pleased they accepted to participate. The first one is Professor Rafael Duarte from Madrid. Rafael is the secretary of EBMT, and he belongs to the Department of Hematology in Madrid. He will speak about infections in Europe. The second speaker is our Chinese colleague, Professor Wang He from Hangzhou, not far from Shanghai. And Professor Wang He is an expert in stem cell transplantation, CAR T cells, but also, in addition, he chaired the special COVID task force who left Hangzhou to go to Wuhan and help his colleagues uh, during the peak of the epidemics. And finally, Professor Arnaud Fontanet uh, from Institut Pasteur and Collège de France will review the status of the COVID epidemic at this moment and possibly the future. Arnaud Fontanet also is a member of the French Scientific Council uh, who, um, who advises uh, our president, Emmanuel Macron. And also I wanted to say, please do not leave immediately after the last talk because there is a debate. I will now introduce the specter of infections in my own field, which is hematology and cell therapy. And this slide already published 10 years ago shows in transplant patients, the risk of infection before, during and after the transplantation. And as you can see here, we have bacteria at the top, viruses and fungi. Even though this uh, slide was done 10 years ago, it's still uh, up to date, except that we have to add on the left part of this slide in red, multi-resistant bacteria, and on the right side, insist upon cytomegalovirus, and also more recently about Bika viruses, which pop, popped up with the introduction of haploidentical transplant and high-dose uh, cytoxin. So I will add one slide regarding bacteria, just to mention that there has been recently some focus on tuberculosis and most of all, latent tuberculosis. And this is a slide which shows the importance of this risk, for instance, here in red, with a prevalence over 50% of the population in South Mexico. Regarding fungal infection, we all know that aspergillosis is not the only one. And I just wanted to find one slide and to show you that we have other risks, such as histoplasmosis. And you will note, of course, at the end of this slide, the mention that mask wearing is protective, as well as HEPA filters, which have been here recently uh, installed in Velour in India, or even more sophisticated system, such as these ones, we and other have in our centers, where in addition to filtering particles like bacteria and fungi, all particles, including also viruses, are now destroyed in an oxygen plasma built environment. And here we are in China, here also with biocare rooms, uh, which have switchable uh, positive or negative pressure adjusted to the need of the team treating a specific patient. Now, unfortunately, comes the coronavirus pandemic and the spike protein, as you can see here, all over. I am showing here today the last statistics from the Johns Hopkins University, with, as you can see, almost 30 million people so far infected throughout the world. And we probably will reach, unfortunately, soon a million of deaths. This slide summarizes, if you go to the last column in red, the number of deaths per million inhabitants per country. 
and I selected the, the nine most unfortunate countries with the highest number of deaths. On, the, on this slide, I put the major consequences of the COVID in our transplant departments. The first one is that the use of unrelated donors has become more complex because of the planification, because of the travels, and therefore the number of unrelated transplants has decreased, and as a consequence, the use of haplo-identical transplants has further increased. The same story is true for CAR T cells, the use of which has decreased. And finally, for all these reasons, there is an increased use of cryopreservation of stem cells for allogenic transplantation. Transplants that are not urgent are postponed, and I'm thinking essentially of autologous transplantation for multiple myelomas. Overall, there is a considerable drop in activity, and we also know that some cryopreserved stem cell sources in the end will not be used. And last but not least, there are financial consequences as here evaluated again in Velour and presented to us two weeks ago at the virtual EBMT meeting in Madrid during the special session of the EBMT Global Committee by Professor Alok Srivastava. And as you can see, any infection, be it bacterial, fungal, or viral, and I don't even think of the recent COVID infection, multiplies the, the expenses for one transplant by two. At the end of this uh, seminar, after the three speakers, I guess we will have many questions. And I summarized here some of the, of the questions we will have. For instance, mutation, do they occur? We know the answer is yes, but does it really matter? This will be one question. A second question will be, will we really get soon directly antiviral new drugs? We do not very often hear of this. And aside from remdesivir, we don't know. And the third question is what about vaccines? We have almost too many vaccines, so probably one is safer than another one, and which one? So just to illustrate the mutation, we have here the uh, first uh, strain of a virus with a G614 trans tra uh, mutation emerging in Europe in blue, as you can see, uh, since April. So it started with D614 and it's now G614. Is it important? About new drugs, I just selected the first one I saw by pure chance about a drug we don't know very well, which is called Opaganib, and which apparently uh, is very effective and more effective than remdesivir or synergizing with remdesivir in destroying the virus. And finally, this uh, slide among very many from the New England Journal of Medicine in July showing uh, important efficacy with mRNA vaccines. So, finished with my introduction, and I would like now to leave the screen to our first invited speaker, Professor Rafael Duarte from Madrid, Spain, and see you at the end of this session for the debate. Thank you. Hello, everyone, dear friends, dear colleagues. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Goran for the opportunity to be uh, here today and to discuss all together about the, the infectious challenges that we're facing in the era of COVID and, and give it our own perspective from, from EBNT and, and from Europe. Uh, I think that um, it is, it is uh, perhaps a diagram like this uh, that, that refers to allogeneic transplant recipients, but we will learn to use as a, as a uh, diagram of risk of infection of the different um, risk factors that, that our patients face, and also what are the, the main, the high incidence major infections that they suffer. And even though this is quite specific to allogeneic transplantation, here the, and chronic GVHD only appears there, many other factors central catheter, mucositis, neutropenia, impaired cellular and humoral uh, immunity with new, with new drugs also affect many other 
hematological patients, hemonc uh, patients. The arrival of COVID-19 has clearly brought additional uh, risks to these patients, not only in the term in terms of the infection itself, but also in how the management that would be enforced to do in these patients is also changing the risk for other infections. I'll try to start with general principles because we're all we can all safely say that general principles should remain. We uh, I'll start with prevention. I think that this is very very. Uh, I'll go quick through through this. Uh, the general guidelines for for uh, prevention of infections need to still uh, be there. The, the isolation procedures are also still applicable in our in our patient, and with those come the specific recommendations that we all follow for ventilation, for single room occupancy, for antimicrobial stewardship, and for all that. The reality is, that, as you know, uh, the pressure on the health system and the pressure on the hospital has made that sometimes we have to manage hematology patients in different conditions. For instance, in my hospital here in Spain, at the big initial outbreak uh, a few months ago, even though we kept the hematology work for transplants functioning the whole time, a lot of the patients that were admitted with COVID went actually to COVID uh, wards, even though part of the hematology team was actually there to look after that. So we kept the, the expertise of the team, even though in a different location. Of course, these uh, general principles apply to all the infections, bacterial infections, and, and we are, our approaches to uh, uh, escalation or de-escalation management based of our epidemiology, based on the resistance that we have, and based on the uh, advantages and disadvantages in terms of overuse of, of antibiotics and, and the potential uh, antibiotic pressure to induce uh, resistance, all those don't change significantly. Um, these are guidelines for treatment of fungal uh, infections, and those also remain pretty much uh, the same in, the, in this context. And I'm focusing initially on this treatment because I think uh, that one of the points I want to, to make is in, the, in this anti-infective management is the, the priority that we need to all bring in prevention and in prophylaxis in this patient. But treatment as such wouldn't really change uh, dramatically. Viral infections, and of all those, the, the major infection that our patients face is CMV infection. And here I've selected from the SL7 guidelines these recommendations for uh, antiviral prophylaxis. The rest of them in within SL have not changed dramatically, but the arrival of Letermovir has really made a difference in these patients. And all these prophylaxis clearly makes a difference in duration of hospitalization and also on the requirement to uh, in, uh, bring patients in and, um, and admit them to hospital if they do have a CME reactivation. So in the current situation of a COVID pandemic, these should be taken as a priority. Recommendations as well for uh, vaccinations. And I think that these uh, are also very relevant. We have them very close to, to our hearts now because SEAL has just uh, updated them uh, very, very recently. All these are tables taken from the EVMT uh, handbook. And I want to highlight perhaps only influenza. Influenza is it's clearly very important, but it's going to be particularly important in this period. And we all know that that, that there's some, there might be some potential cross-reactivity that might make some vaccinated patients a bit less uh, susceptible to severe forms of disease. But more important than that, what would be really difficult to manage is the overlap of a COVID pandemic with also a, a flu season in which we don't take as much measures as we can to prevent uh, influenza in our patients. All the others don't change very dramatically and you know all these recommendations I must have hemophilus diphtheria all these recommendations do not do not change uh, dramatically in these patients i think it's important to consider that there's not a unique 
vaccine schedule that we can apply to all. Uh, clearly, the benefits are both for the society to, to avoid at a population level, uh, creating a host of, of immunity, but also it makes an individual interest for each of our patients. And as the COVID vaccines are under development, as the, and they come with different mechanisms and different ways of action, we'll have to see when we have the results, how uh, our patients are uh, approach the possibility of receiving COVID vaccination. That's something that will develop in the next few months. What is the impact in this very brief summary of uh, anti-infective management and the general guidelines? What is the impact that COVID is, is having and what is the impact that we've experienced? Clearly, the impact goes not only in infection, but much beyond. There's an unprecedented pressure on healthcare systems, not only at the hospitals, but also primary care and ICUs. Uh, there's uh, changes in the allocation of resources. Uh, there's disruption of the transplant teams, uh, not only uh, you know, physicians that get infected, but also uh, quarantined, and then decisions that are taken away from teams to be able to look after the COVID uh, patients. I told you a little before about how we organized that, and many of my team, the members of my team, actually had to look after COVID patients, and one of the ways we arranged it is that hematology patients with COVID were specifically looked after these, these physicians, these, these team members. There's been clearly issues about unrelated donor uh, procurement, not only assessment, but also collection and transportation. And uh, it is very important as well, knowing how COVID infection itself has had an impact as an infectious complication in these patients. And all these under the uncertainty that we've had about the management of patients that are already immunosuppressed and who are at risk for, for in infections and for whom many of the treatments that we've been uh, trying uh, in, during the pandemic, uh, we, we didn't have a lot of evidence about understanding how they would come. There's been clear recommendations. I think that, that, that is a, a tribute to, to everyone in, in, in different societies who made the effort of very rapidly from a scientific society, provide us all, provide the community with recommendations for this challenge, how managing these patients in particular, transplant recipients and CAR, immunotherapy, CAR, uh, T cell therapy uh, patients have been addressed in, in some guidelines. Also, and of course with the, with the higher experience of having experienced this pandemic earlier, a lot of this information is coming from, from China. Uh, Professor He Huang uh, is, is, is one of the leading uh, authors, along with many other international and Chinese colleagues of these specific management strategies and challenges for, for CAR-T. The reality, though, is that even though we've had all this uh, information, granularity of information about infected complications other than COVID itself is still uh, small, it's still something that we have to collect and the repositories and registries where we're collecting this data, including the BMT, and hopefully we'll learn soon. I want to give a general concept coming to, to, to this point, and is that beyond the specific uh, microorganism, the management of infections, uh, opportunistic infection in hematology and patients really can rely on, 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 a, on a few tools. We can rely on prophylaxis, as long as it's effective and safe. Uh, it relies as well on diagnostic tools, and we know that that, that is something that, that is obviously very important that has been developed uh, and is the way to, to treat uh, more accurately these patients and also on, on the availability of, of treatments. I think that all, all, all these three parts of the, of, the, of the creation of tools that we can use to manage these patients uh, in the context of, an, of a pandemic, on the pressure over, over hospital uh, wards and, and beds, clearly lead us all to give a, a, a higher importance, higher relevance to the role of prophylaxis. And this applies to many different infections. I'd, I'd like to highlight two. Fungal infections, clearly fungal infections are not only prevalent, and, and the rates are in excess of uh, 10, 12, 15 percent in, 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 in hemong high-risk patients, primarily 
uh, acute leukemia, myelosplastic syndrome screening with high uh, intensive uh, chemotherapy for induction, and also allogeneic transplant recipients, in particular those with graft versus host uh, disease. Uh, but there are also other patients that still would be, would, would be benefit from some uh, prophylaxis, even if not necessarily only for mold cover, but high-risk patients need mold and, and yeast cover for prophylaxis. And, uh, and at the same time, during, uh, during a long time, we've sort of faced that duality of prophylaxis and diagnostics as something that it was not um, easy to reconcile uh, as prophylaxis reduces the incidence of infection and therefore the performance of the test. At the same time, the test don't, don't, don't work so well in patients that are receiving some, some drugs and prophylaxis. So I think that we, we've made a, a, an effort, and I'll summarize this with our additional data or slides, and there's a couple of, of studies. We, we published the first uh, study in CID in 2014 showing that patients with effective prophylaxis with post muscle could still be monitored with, with Galactamana, not necessarily in the screening uh, period as uh, surveillance, but yes, in, in diagnosis, still remain useful for diagnostics. And this was validated externally later from another group here in, in Madrid from Gregorio Bagnon using a different drug for prophylaxis, prophylaxis with Caspa fungi. And they also showed that we can reconcile effective prophylaxis with diagnosis to treat uh, and benefit patients. This becomes a, a priority now, even in centers that traditionally may not, may, may not have used prophylaxis as a standard of care. Uh, also, uh, in cytomegalovirus, cytomegalovirus we've treated for, for decades. We, we've learned to, to, to use the diagnostic tests we have and at the same time the drugs that we have available to treat. We know about the side effects and we know that beyond all these strategies, uh, after more than two decades of, of a preemptive therapy strategy based on, on, on diagnostic tests, patients at risk for cytomegalovirus and those that reactivate do worse are patients that do not reactivate uh, cytomegalovirus that, that are not at risk, and a difference of around 10 to 15 percent in overall survival. Clearly, the arrival of latermavir has made a difference on, on this and improves outcome, reduces all cause mortality, and reduces dramatically the incidence of infection, which also associates with reduction of the on, on the days of admission and reduction of the hospital uh, stay and need for readmission in subsequent recurrent CMB reactivation. So uh, I cannot stress enough the role of prophylaxis in this context of a COVID pandemic. What is the impact that we see? I'm gonna share with you some, some data. This is activity from the Spanish uh, Transplant Organization. And you can see that in the months of the bulk of the pandemic, clearly comparing 2019 to 2020, the antiretroviral transplant activity reduced dramatically. Not only that, we are seeing as well a very sharp reduction in the number of requests for CAR T therapy. CAR T therapy is, is much more advanced, it has been developed much, much better in, in, in China, it has been here in Spain where we were for the most time, and, and largely in, in Europe where, where for the most part uh, it's been recently since just uh, a few months, year ago, that we started using CAR T cells and that started being available to, to our patients. But nevertheless, even though you see you know, a progressive increase in the, in, in the use, you can easily see that when in the month of March this year, the request and part of the, of the committee of the Ministry of Health that evaluates our, our, all the requests, all the requests that still at this point is to be centrally evaluated, one of the members of that committee. And, and we were, you know, for the past months, we were very busy evaluating all these requests quite, quite often because it's got to be at least three of them. This evaluation, and however, right now there's, there's very few, hardly any uh, CAR T uh, requests. That's something that we also have to make up for in the second wave of the of the pandemic. And outcomes. Uh, I'm going to share with you a little summary of data from a couple of the studies. This is a study from the Spanish transplant group that includes not only transplant but also non-transplant hemolytic patients. 41 
centers, both pediatric and adult patients, is retrospective uh, analysis. The primary objective was to describe the clinical characteristics of these, these patients, try to, to figure out how, how is it that they look like, and also looking at some analysis of mortality and potential risk factors that associate with, with mortality or with the potential benefit from the treatments that we were using in all COVID patients, hemong and others. And this is the summary. These are the outcomes, uh, and these are the patients that we have. Uh, there's 244 non-transplant hemonc recipients, and then autologous analogenic transplantations. Clearly, there's demographics that vary between type of patient, and that just probably defines how how uh, candidates for autologous and allogenic transplantation and some are somewhat selected based on these demographic factors. So it won't take much time there and these are the factors that, that really influence uh, results. The independent risk factors for having a severe form of COVID in hemong patients are hypertension, lymphopenia and CRP and we don't see really differences in clinical laboratory characteristics between the transplanted and the non-transplanted with regards to, to uh, the severity and the presentation or the duration of hospital admission with COVID-19. More uh, results from the Spanish study. There were differences between uh, the transplant recipient and non-transplant recipients in terms of antiviral therapy and the use of corticosteroids, uh, which is greater in, in transplant recipients than it has been in the, in the general uh, population of other hemong uh, patients. And also the recovery from, from COVID as, uh, as a result probably of the, of the deeper immune suppression uh, that these patients have. Uh, conversely to what, what one would have perhaps anticipated, it was not uh, a poor outcome. The overall, had, if anything, a lower overall mortality in transplant recipients compared to, to, to the others. As you saw, the demographics were different. There were more comorbidities in the other patients, but nevertheless, being a transplant recipient doesn't put you automatically in a far worse risk of this, of this infection. These are the curves, and as you can see, the, the uh, based on COVID stage and based on risk factor, uh, having zero to one, two or more than two older age disease status, neutropenia and high CRP are the main drivers of mortality in, in hemoglobin patients uh, treated with COVID. Clearly, there's still things that we are missing in terms of uh, uh, of um, a total uh, understanding of the factors that influence this outcome. And, and we are uh, engaging uh, the Spanish study with the high incidence that we had with EBMT in a combined analysis with large environment to explore all these preliminary data from this combined analysis has been presented, have been presented by, by Per Lindemann at virtual EBMT 2020 just a few uh, days ago and you've got their curves of survival by type of transplant, allogeneic and autologous, and you've got there the B-log ranks not statistically significant, and this is not with this number, and same thing, uh, survival depending uh, on, on age, children and adults. If we were, when we looked into, into these factors to see the, into this study, to see the factors that really associate with that, perhaps the most striking difference is that that is age uh, at COVID and, and performance status that makes a real difference beyond other other factors that are probably also associated with the uh, um, makes sense in, in in the findings that we had at the Spanish study of the of the out transplant recipients not doing worse than the hemon patients that overall have a higher age as well. So I think that we I'll, I'll leave it with some lessons for for the future and with two small uh, comments. We gotta try and maintain the activity. It doesn't look like this is. You know, it's going to go anytime soon. So we are we we got to keep the activity of of transplantation and cellular therapy in these patients. And I think that we need to highlight that there's a need to for the strict measures of infectious disease control for prevention in inpatients and outpatients to be done. That goes along with telemedicine, with, with many other strategies. And also, I want to highlight the fact that anti-infective strategies should be particularly proactive to prevent infection complications with the use of primary prophylaxis. Prevention is paramount in these circumstances. And I'll leave you just with, with a few 
images in this in the last uh, couple of minutes. You know that, uh, that that we had this this congress in EBM Ticos in plan for Madrid this year uh, in in March. Uh, FEMA is is the th the third largest and um, um, uh, uh, convention center in the in the world for uh, for um, international uh, conferences. This was planned for March this year. This is what we used to do. These are the the meetings where we all uh, where we all made the interaction that we normally had. And however, we ended up having and having to transform that to a virtual meeting, and it's been very successful. We have over six thousand seven hundred participants. The sessions have, have been have had more participation through the virtual tool that we could ever uh, have imagined in a in an on-site physical meeting. But clearly, also uh, have come with some limitations. Uh, this is the, the, the map of, of, of IFEMA, and this whole nine and the north um, convention center is what we were going to use for our Congress. And this is whole nine in March, right that same weekend that we were going to start the, the Congress. And what we were building there, unfortunately, were not the, the industry um, stands for for education and for communication, it was beds for this large hospital that we that we set up, second to the one in Wuhan, the, the largest in the world after one in, in, in Wuhan here in in, in Madrid, and uh, we it, uh, also decided that nevertheless we're still planning for a hybrid meeting we'll have to see uh, in in march next year so hopefully if everything goes well depending on the on the uh, pandemic during this winter we'll hopefully have at least an on site and also access virtual depending in, in, on the circumstance for for everyone to be able to tailor the meeting to their needs and fa finish with my last slide which uh, brings a discussion that I think also needs to be optimistic. We're suffering from this infection, our patients are suffering from this infection, and hemoglobin patients are suffering from this, but also hematology, oncology, hematology is also uh, fighting back the disease. And I'm gonna leave you here only the image, and I encourage you, if you didn't have a chance to go back to our website, to the ABMT uh, Virtual 2020 website, and listen how uh, endothelial treatment and dysfunction, how mesenchymal stromal cells, how uh, convalescent plasma, how many of the antibodies, molecular antibodies that we use in the treatment of our patients are also potentially of use in COVID. Thank you very much again for the invitation and I'll be looking forward to, to answering questions and to discuss at the end. Thank you again. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear Professor Goring and uh, the um, colleagues. Uh, it's my pleasure attending this meeting. Uh, I'd like to talk about the prevention and the treatment of the major infectious disease in hematology and oncology patients in the COVID-19 era. I, Dr. Huang, come from the Zhejiang University School of Medicine, the first every hospital. So I'd like to talk of the three uh, subtopic. One is the pandemic of the COVID-19 in China and the influence of the hematological malignancies. We all know the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and first in China, uh, February and uh, lasted about the three months. So here is the total confirmed case and we can see here is from the February and uh, January, February and uh, down here about the area and the stop here, the case not increased. The very new confirmed case we can see here is the uh, March and the February is uh, very high. And uh, in here is a member of China and uh, all the Zhejiang, Zhejiang province also the heaven hit by the pandemic. So uh, I'm sorry, we can see here the pandemic globally, the COVID-19 is very uh, spread is very fast and here is a con uh, the confirmed diagnosis. 
So Americans and the another European countries, another Africa is many countries have the from the globally the COVID-19. So how about the climatological disease during the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, here is the publication in China, the Wuhan hospital, and the total is 21 climatological disease patients suffer from the COVID-19. And the analysis comparison of the over survivor in patients with climatological malignancies patients and uh, by the COVID-19 and under the intensive chemotherapy and the undergoing intensive chemotherapy or immunosuppression. And we can see here, the patients if the sufferers receive the chemotherapy or immunosuppression treatment, the survivor is very, very poor. Another the publication also analysis the influence of the COVID-19 on the climatological disease. Uh, we can see here the in patients with the uncont uncontrolled climatological malignancies and the 10 of the COVID-19, the mortality was 33%. Uh, is the high is 63% versus the, uh, the control is 80%. So in patients with uncontrolled climatological disease and the 10 of the COVID-19, the mortality was higher, 40, 44. The transplantation patients is mortality is also high. The influence of the COVID-19 chemotological, the conclusion is COVID-19 was severe in patients with chemotological malignancies. And their survival was strongly correlated with the COVID-19 stage. And the patient and the disease related factor, just like the old aging, disease status, performer status, immune situations, and the systemic. In inflammation. The prolonged incubation period, the complied laboratory patents and the confirmed radi radiological funding are finding uh, might eventually lead to the misdiagnosis of COVID-19. And the hematological cancer treatment during this critical period should be adjusted on the case-by-case -case basis. The importance of the home-based oral chemotherapy or reduced clinic-based simplified chemotherapy regimens with the higher therapeutic efficacy and the low toxicity for patients with chemotological malignancies. So second, I'd like to talk about the management of chemotological malignancies in the COVID-19 area. And here is the special special characteristic of the hematological malignancies patients. Here is the publication uh, by the Wuhan hospital. Such the patients is suffer from the COVID-19 in the uh, hematological malignancies. We can see here the characteristic intervention by report COVID-19 case. Uh, the fevers, uh, polo uh, poloxima, dry coffees, and the productive coffees and the and I think the respiratory resistance uh, manifestation is very very important, very uh, important. And for the CT scan, we should the differential diagnosis for the another uh, virus infections. Here is a special characteristic of the hematological malignant patients. These patients is the 51 years old was confirmed with COVID-19. We can see here the CT scan shows the changing. And here is the, another patient is the CMV pneumonia and the 26 years old the male after orogenic stem cell transplantation. We can see here the CT scan shows the different and it is more solid in the COVID-19 patients, the, new, the CT scan changing. A special characterization of the, the hematological malignant patients. The rest can common and the more delayed clinical features such as the mild fever and the, the no productive cough. The laboratory results of the coexisting hematological malignancies might not quite consistent with or even contradict with the reported COVID-19 specific uh, patterns. 
Due to the function defect of the T cell or the monocytic macrophage system, the imaging results of the hematological malignancy in the individual won't uh, divide from the typical presentation. The incubation period of the COVID-19 and the disease cause of the COVID-19 could be prolonged in the background of the hematological malignancy disease. The treatment strategy to check the coexistence of the COVID-19 and the hematological malignancies should be taken into the consideration with the adjusted chemotherapy dose, adjusted transplantation stage, adjusted chemotherapy antigen receptors, regions, and the enhanced supportive strategies. In our sentence, we have the published uh, articles and uh, we provide uh, the protocol and the flow of the algorithm of the hospital admission process procedure of the hematological malignancies patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. And as such, the patients in our hospital and first we would like to confirm this uh, uh, evaluated the high risk area or the low risk area. And for the high risk area, we should end first with the check the clinical symptoms. If the positive, we'd like to blood test, just the CT scan and the antigen, the COVID-19, and the uh, MDT discussion, and another the antibody, COVID-19 antibody test. Uh, for such patients with the evaluation of the tumor burden, and then we'd like to divide the new diagnosis, uh, relapse and refractory and remissions, and we have the different uh, treatment. And for such the history of the exposure of the clinical symptoms, and we'd like to check the chest CT scan, blood, and the antigens, and we'd like to divide it into different awards. Here is also a summary, the overview of the management strategies of the hematological malignant patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. So, and the first, the identification of the hematological malignancy patients a typical COVID-19 clinical manifestation just like a cough, fever, dyspnea of the even behind the chest, tightness, the longer incubation period. And another is should be the diagnosis and the differential diagnosis. We should be perform some of the tests just like the antigens and the body. And then the adjusted treatment regimens for the hematological cancer. For such a patient, the special time may be the oral and the take home the therapies are preferred. And the simplified regimen for the radio reduce the hospitalization and the determine uh, the deferment of the treatment for the stable and the no high risk blood cancer follow up. And the hospital management for the hematological uh, patients, if the, such the patients and the in our hospital improve the emergency response for the hematological oncology ward, remote medical guidance and the therapies and the parent report of the suspended and confirmed the patients. And uh, we'd like to enhance our education, the personal hygiene and the preventive medicines measures just like the wearing face mask and the proper hand wash and the social distance is very important. And another is the quarantine and isolation, the so fix the care caregivers and the adequate nutrition. And the finally, the in intervention and the management of the COVID-19 infection. If the patient's this diagnosis is from the COVID-19, and we have the, to the special ward for the special treatment. And for the transplantation ward, because all the performed in many cases every year the transplantation, how about the round the transplantation ward in the uh, COVID-19 era? So the optimization of the screen and the admission process. And in our hospital, there is the fever clinic. And, and first, the independent area, standardized the procedures, three zone and the three passengers. And the preview the changing patient's classification independent function of section and the patient management. If the, all the patients should be wear the mask and this, uh, minimize the staging, staging time.
And the pre-transplantation way that like manages a human part of stem cell transplantation, it's a high community prevalence area. And we should uh, do emergency transplantation and screen for the uh, COVID-19 and the chest CT scan and the genomic sequence and the detection of the serial antibody. And if negative, the positive and we will move to the special wall and the negative will continue, go on for transplantation. For the transplantation and the unrelated donors, uh, sometimes it's very uh, restricted because it's the shaping and the cryopreservation. preservation and the way the like to cryopreservation preservation advance of the transplantation before the condition regimen. And the an alternative hyperidentical is a backup and the corrected and cryopreserved cry autolog stem cell transplantation as a backup. So another the related donor also we suggest that the patients have the backup donor and the autologers and, and the GCS and the breast form based the mobilization which means prepared. And the post-transplantation, the education patient and all family members on the instruction regardless of isolation and the preventative measures. The so self isolation and the home and minimize the number of the family members to risk. And the telemedicine is visited or online visiting. And the explore ways to the patients have the good blood test away from the busy area in hospital. So isolation of the patients. So human particle stem cell transplantation in all the BNT, uh, we just say that China is a peak uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19 and the, from the February to the April. And, the, and the, this time, and we also performed the 49 patients received the transplantation, including the 39 hepro transplantation and the four is identical siblings and the one is the unrelated donors and the five the autologous stem cell transplantation. And then in China cities, another cities was hit to face the risk of the explosive spread of the COVID-19. And so we will have the, such as a recommendation, the protocol to avoid the risk of the pandemic. And for the another the platform is CAR-T treatment because all the performed CAR-T many cases so how about the CAR-T patients with uh, COVID-19 era? The clinical characteristic of the CAR-T therapy is candid candidates because such the patients and uh, the always aggressive or uh, progressive disease. And the CAR-T therapies might be the sole options for those with the high risk of hematological malignancies. So we should evaluate the pandemic risk and the how about the, the treat patients. And the rapid disease progression requires a tiny manifest manufacturers and the infusion of the CAR T cell into these patients. Hence, weighing the risk and the benefit of the CAR T therapies and improving the practical efficiencies of the treatment during this critical period of what most important. So here you will also have to provide uh, protocols how about the admission procedures of for CAR T treatment during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we uh, suggest the evaluation, evaluation of the pandemic prevalence and the high community prevalence and the low community prevalence. And if the high weight at first the uh, so weight and the watch and the and risk of 14 days and the recharge the screen and the differential diagnosis uh, PRT PCRs long CT scan and the CRO IgM detection and the expert consulting. And if the negative and the weight differential the diagnosis of the COVID-19, the patients receive the CAR T treatment and the discharge instruction and we will suggest the patients wearing the fast face mask and the wash can, social distancing, minimizing the business, avoiding the crowd places. Follow up, we suggest that the patients online follow up with the 24 hours and any time if necessary. So all the patients follow up in the local hospital, such as the community hospital, IPIGs, or uh, replacement injection. So for the CAR T cell donors, also we should be the screen 
the COVID-19. And for the uh, symptomatic donors, is we were evaluated the, the epidemic histories and the evaluation of the clinic manifestation. Uh, we suggest that the donor receive the, such as a screen, the RT-PCR and the long CT scan and the serious IgG IgM detection and expert consolidation. And the, such as a, after such as a screen, the patient, the donor can be the eligible, eligible donors. Uh, here is the published is the BB, uh, BB, uh, B, BMT and also suggest the CAR T cell resources and the potential disrupt during the pandemic. Maybe the aphalasis and the cell processing and the shipping and the logistic manufacturing, hospital capacities, ICU capacities, blood bank, laboratory tests and radiation, pathology, give care given and hosting. So such the all factors should be considered by the physicians. And here is the, all the for the CAR T uh, treatment strategy and in the a summary of the representative regions from China mainland, so from the January to the March uh, this year. And here is all hospital. We can see here is the perform the CAR T treatment patients. Here is the Tongqi hospital, and another is the uh, Tianjin hospital, another hospital. And from this, the uh, we can see here is the Wuhan. Wuhan, we think, is the stone sand. The pandemic scent and the virus is CAR T scent, and we can see here the number changing. Here is from the January to March and the two, uh, 2019, and here is the from July, uh, July to the September uh, 2019. But here is this year, the first three months, and from January to the March is the drop down the case. So strategy in infection disease during the COVID-19 pandemic, the patients with cancer with the fever or respiratory syndrome consider causes in addition to the COVID-19, including other infection and the therapies related to pneumonia pneumotypes. Initials should be alert on the possibility of the alert, uh, alternative or second infection. And the vaccination against the influenza and enhance to the another recommendation measures to reduce the infection, infection risk. Patients with hematological oncology disease developed symptoms should be minimized treated related immune suppression to the reduce the risk of the drug lethal reaction. Finally, we'd like to talk the clinical trial in the CIS induced by the CAR T and the COVID-19. Uh, we all know the CAR T and the COVID-19 all induce the patients suffer from the cytokine release syndrome. The cytokine release syndrome is potentially life-threatening symptoms caused by the viral infection, autoimmune disease, and the administration of the antibody-based therapies. Uh, and the cytokine uh, stone symptoms and the pathological and the potential precision therapies is carries the risk. And the CIS induced the CAR T treatment is induced by the direct target cell rinses with the consecutive release of the cytokine. This cytokine trigger chain reactions due to the activation of the innate immune cell, like the macrophage and the endothelial cells with the further cytokine release syndrome. So we'd like to question, ask a question, some difference or similarity between the CIS induced by CAR T or the COVID-19. And the way analysis of hospital and the COVID-19 group is 40 patients and the CAR-T is 41 patients from all the hospital and the uh, treated such as a, a grade three or more the severe CIS. And we can see here one is group is COVID-19 group is a CAR-T group. And there are some difference here is the maximum temperature and the CAR T temperature is higher, and the cough and the, and the uh, COVID 19 is higher. And another is just like breathing, breathing disease, breathing uh, difficulties is higher in the COVID 19, 
and the hypotension and hypoxemia also. And we can see here is the CIS induced the CAR T and COVID-19. And here is the incidence of the clinical symptoms and COVID-19, CAR T, and the expectation. Here is the CAR, expectation, dyspnea, hypoxemia, and the hypotension. There are some difference. And COVID-19 and CAR T, there is the maximum temperature. And here is the, we can see the CAR T patients is higher and the duration of the fever is also. And as the peak serial level of the cytokine, uh, procatonia and the C-reactive proteins, the dimers and the ferritins, and the, with the grade three or four CIS in COVID-19 group and the CAR-T group. And the data shows the described as a media. So we can see here is a CAR-T, and almost is uh, higher, uh, CAR-T is uh, interleukin-2, interleukin-6, interleukin-10, and uh, also interferon. And uh, here is uh, just the here the interferon alpha is the COVID-19 is higher than the CAR-T. And another is uh, also almost is uh, higher than the uh, CAR-T group is more higher than the COVID-19 group. The correction between the virus log and the tumor burdens and the cytokine levels with the CIS in COVID-19 group and the CAR-T group. And the correlation and the linear regressions was used for the statistic analysis. We can see here is uh, very clear the correlation between the uh, virus burden uh, load and the leukemia burden. A complication in patients with the severe the CIS, we can see here the COVID-19 and uh, CAR-T, and there are some the respiratory failure. There are some difference. COVID-19 is higher. And here is the transfer for the ICU, also higher in the COVID-19 group. So inflammatory response in the CIS caused the COVID-19 and the CAR-T cell therapy was similar, but the difference intensity. Cytokine like interleukin-6, interleukin-10, interleukin-2, interferon alpha, interferon gamma experienced the variable increased the two group with the interferon alpha exhibited a significant higher levels in the COVID-19 group. The diagnosis and the treatment experience of the CIS in CAR T cell therapies may provide a great uh, impetus for the CIS. Interferon alpha inhibitors and the CIS COVID-19 specific CAR-T therapies may be feasible selected with the core as a further investigation and a quant uh, clinical experience. So I think the COVID-19, the pandemic, and the CAR-T, and the, we have some the similar the symptoms, but I think the mechanism is the total difference. So in futures, we'd like to further study such as the uh, CAR-T and the pandemic, how about the uh, CIS and how about to use the, some of the uh, methods in intervention. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. So hello everybody, it's my pleasure to give this lecture on the COVID-19 pandemic. I, the title I use is season two, uh, meaning that for many countries we have had our first wave and now I would want to share with you my views on what we have to expect for the coming month. I know some countries are still in the middle of the first wave, but basically I think that this talk will address many different issues that will be relevant to, to all of you uh, watching this video. So my name is Arnaud Fontanet. I am a professor at Institut Pasteur, the head of the Department of Global Health. I'm also teaching public health at the Conservatoire National des Arts et Métiers, and I was also making a course on pandemics at the Collège de France last year. And uh, finally, I am a member of the Scientific Council advising the French government on the COVID-19 crisis, and I have no conflict of interest to declare. I will start by focusing on the situation on France. As you can see here, um, this slide is showing you estimates made by mathematical models of the 
proportion of people that have been infected at the end of the first wave in France. We are on May 11th. And as you can see here, uh, the estimate is that about 4.4% of the population of France has been infected um, between February and April, to make it simple. And uh, that um, epidemic uh, began in the eastern part of France, as well as in a cluster in the northern part of France. And this explains why these regions of France have been more severely hit. We believe that about 10% of people have been infected there, whereas about 5% of people have been infected in the middle of France and only 3% in the western part, which is called Bataille. The R0, the basic reproductive number, which tells you for each patient, how many people would get infected was estimated at three at the beginning of the pandemic or in the epidemic for France. Uh, we, and uh, this is in the absence of control measures. You know, it, when the virus was circulating freely in France because people were not aware yet that it had arrived. And uh, mathematical modeling tells us that the proportion of people that would need to be immunized for the virus to stop to circulate spontaneously, freely, with an R0 estimated at three, should be one minus one over R0, which in this case will make 67%. What we are saying here is that it will need 67% of the population of France to be infected with the new SARS coronavirus before the epidemic stops spontaneously. Um, the first question I'm going to address is, as you may know, France, like many other countries, had to put in place a lockdown. Um, that happened for us in, on March 17. Uh, the first two weeks of March was a time where the epidemic was raging in France. And the uh, scientific council, to which I belong, uh, advised the government when we met for the first time on March 12 to uh, move quickly to a lockdown, which was put in place on March 17 as intensive care units in France were just completely overwhelmed with patients arriving with this uh, very severe uh, lung inflammation. And um, in the eastern part of France and the northern part of France, the intensive care units could no longer cope with those patients arriving in very large numbers. So the decision was made to uh, put a lockdown on France. But the difficult one was, should it be restricted to the parts which were most affected by the epidemic, I mean the eastern part of France and the northern part of France, or should it be done nationally? And of course, you realize that the social and economic cost of a lockdown is huge. So uh, that decision was not an easy one to, to, to take at that time. We finally decided to go for a national lockdown. And retrospectively, when we got the data completely consolidated, we realized that we were probably right. On this uh, slide, you can see the 13 regions of France. And you have here the epidemic curve based on the admission to hospital. Here is a threshold of one admission per 100,000 inhabitants, where we would consider that the epidemic has gone wild when you reach that threshold, you know, and that it would be extremely difficult to stop it with typical control measures particularly at a time where in France, we did not have enough tests, we did not have enough masks. So um, as you can see here, all the region of France end up reaching that threshold before peaking. The so first one to reach it was the Grand Est, which is the eastern part of France. And you can see that where that was around the 10th of March. And, and that's where the epidemic curve was worst. This is northern part of France, and Ile-de-France is Paris and this region. And you can see also that this threshold was met quite early. The region of France which reached the threshold the latest was Bretagne, in the western part of France. And you can see that that was around the 23rd of March. The lockdown had been put in place here, as you can see with this line, which means this is 17th of March, and it is the time the lockdown was put in place. So the first message is, Wherever you were in France, at some point before the peak of the admissions of hospitals, the epidemic had reached a stage where it would have been unstoppable. And this is why it has been important that the lockdown was put in place. The second interesting message of these slides is that regardless of whether your epidemic started very early or quite late, like in Bretagne, 
the time when the uh, admissions peaked was about the same. It was, as you can read here, 28th of March is the time of the peak, plus or minus one or two days, if you want, if you look at the different regions. And that is exactly 11 days after the lockdown was put in place. And 11 days is a time between infection and hospitalizations for the people who do the severe form of disease. What we are seeing here is that it is a lockdown and not anything else magic that stopped the admissions to hospitals. And therefore, it has been truly efficient. Uh, and whether your epidemic has started very early, like the eastern part of France, or very late, like Bretagne, it's exactly at the same time that it will stop. And that is the effect of the lockdown, and it was important that we could document that. Now, um, when we look at Europe, I mean, and different surveys which have been performed using antibody tests, what was the proportion of population that has been infected? We saw that for France, mathematical modeling was pointing at 4.4%. Spain, which was also very severely hit by the epidemic, the threshold was the proportions of population infected was 5%. Geneva, but this is just the city of Geneva, it's not the entire Switzerland, was 10%. And this is what we have seen in France, uh, in Paris, in the big cities of the eastern part of France, we have about 10% of people infected. Sweden, 7%, but that was in April. You know that since the epidemic has continued to progress in Sweden, and Finland, which has been quite spared by the epidemic, is at the lower level on 2%. And here are the figures for the blood donors. Now, there are some questions. Do we truly need to get these 66 or 67% of the population immunized before uh, we reach herd immunity? Or could it happen earlier? And some people have been questioning that and saying, well, I mean, we find this figure far too large. As you could see from the previous slide, I mean, we are talking about 5 to 10% of population that has been infected. It means we would have done only 20% of the road to herd immunity. This is really sad news. So there are some issues like would seasonal coronavirus, for instance, protect us? And um, you know that uh, this new coronavirus is somewhere between seasonal coronavirus that gives flu or the SARS or the MERS that gave severe lung disease when it comes to clinical manifestations. And some people felt like there is a very large proportion of individuals who got seasonal coronavirus in, in the world. And uh, maybe that gives you some protection. And there are some work on T-cell immunity suggesting that. There are some people also who have been measuring the T-cell reactivity among the contacts of the patients. The contacts did not get antibodies, but they do show some T-cell reactivity. Does it protect? And then there are issues of this theory of two thirds of the population has to be immunized before the virus stops to circulate spontaneously is based on simple mathematical models where people just mix what we say homogeneously, you know, and um, there is not sort of uh, um, some people that get very socially connected and would be the first to be infected and then um, would uh, themselves infect other people because they are socially connected and other people that would be very excluded from society, for instance. And if that happens, then indeed that figure should be lower. At the end of the day, um, when it comes to this heterogeneity, it may have an impact, but probably not as large as some of it's expected. And finally, the children, and I will come back to that. I mean, it seems that children are less likely to become infected and also that they would be less likely to infect others, particularly the children less than 10 years of age. What is it about all that? I'm going to touch upon some of those points in the next couple of slides and then summarize a little bit our thoughts about this. Um, we had actually in France a natural experience of um, infection in a place where people sort of mix quite homogeneously, which was an aircraft carrier, Charles de Gaulle, and there, um, the sailors were on board on 15th of March. Uh, they waited two weeks and were very careful uh, trying to find out is the disease on the ship or not. And then after two weeks, there were no declared cases and they felt like, that's fine. I mean, we, are, we did not embark with the virus. And they started to mix more like they usually do when they are uh, sailing. And then the epidemic started, as you can see here. And out of uh, 1,568 sailors, I mean, 70% of them got infected. And that tells you basically that in a place where you mix like you would on, on, on this uh, ship like this one, 
Well, um, you do reach the herd immunity before the epidemic stops. And the seasonal coronavirus, for instance, did not play much a role. The immunities that some may have got uh, being in contact with others that got infected first also did not play much a role. And when it comes to this story of homogeneous mixing, clearly 70% would be the figure that you reach. Uh, and as I said, some models that have been worked since do suggest that eventually, if you have some very highly susceptible people that get infected first, or if, for instance, the older people do not mix socially as much as the younger people, you may decrease your 67% to something like 50%, but probably not much lower. The children, the data are a little bit complex here. Um, what we all agree with is to say that they develop mild disease. It's very rare that children do a severe disease. Um, there are some indications that they are less susceptible to infection, but it's a little bit controversial. When you look at the viral load in their throats, clearly they have the same viral load than adults, so they should be as contagious. However, when you look at the data, and uh, particularly among children less than 12 years of age, it seems that the virus doesn't spread as easily from children of that age to others or to the adults. Uh, that could be eventually because they are less symptomatic and because they are less symptomatic, they don't cough and therefore they are not as contagious. Now let's move to history and what is happening. Um, how do you reach herd immunity naturally? So naturally, what has happened with those uh, pandemic flus? You know, we had 100 years ago the Spanish flu and then we had three other pandemics, the last one being in 2009. And what did we learn from those pandemic flus? Well, um, you do have several waves. You don't reach that herd immunity in one go. And uh, for the pandemic flu, the first wave started in the summer and then was followed by another one in autumn and then in the winter. The first one actually did not kill that much. The case fatality rate was 0.35%. But the second wave, the autumn one, as you can see here with the death, did kill more, 2.3%. And the third one was sort of in between. But as you can see, um, there has been several waves and there have been some control measures taken for the Spanish flu. That was less the case for the 2009 pandemic where fortunately the virus was not that dangerous. And there, uh, there have been also several waves. Here you have New York, where you can see the first wave was in the spring and the second one in the autumn and winter. And if you look at the United Kingdom, you had three waves, first one in the summer 2009, second one in the autumn, and then you had to wait for the winter 2010 to see the third wave. So these are three cumulative waves before you can reach for pandemic flu, the herd immunity, and it becomes completely seasonal. And as you can see, season makes an effect, but probably not the first year when nobody is immune, when you do have some circulation of the virus, despite the fact that you are in the summer. But later on, it becomes seasonal, like all of respiratory virus. When it's cold, people are inside, and those viruses are more easily transmitted in, indoors. So what do we need to control the viral circulation? And this is the way I'm going to end this talk. As we have understood, for the SARS coronavirus, there are currently two pillars for uh, controlling the epidemic, which have been used in uh, Asia, particularly with success. You need to have those barrier measures that you all know. I mean, we have a physical distance of one meter. You wash hands, you clean the surfaces, you wear masks, and uh, you try to be careful with the confined environment because clearly it is there that you have the largest clusters. Then you need to test, trace, and isolate. And the testing so far has been done with those tubes that you put in your nose, which are a bit uncomfortable, and and get your results after two days. What I hope for this autumn of 2020 is that we will soon have salivary tests, which gives you results in less than one hour and that's much more convenient because it's not as unpleasant, I would say, than getting this nose test. And we may eventually also use those smartphone apps which tell you whether you have been in contact with somebody who got infected. Currently, they don't work that well. Um, matter of how to uh, parameter them, but well, I mean, maybe with some progress, they could be very useful for purpose tracing. And we need to target the super spreading events and to prevent them. What we have learned during this uh, first wave of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic is that the clusters took place in confined environments, like, such as bars, cruise ships, um, disco, meatpacking plants, workers' dormitories, churches, nursing homes, confined environments that we have to really make a very 
basically a surveillance there, eventually close some of them and avoid a large gathering of people. This is the best way to control the viral circulation until we get what we need most at this stage, which are drugs and vaccine. Drugs because we would be able to prevent the severe forms of disease, and that's what we want to avoid. We have made some progress with the anticoagulating drugs, like um, the um, heparin like of drugs, with these um, corticosteroids. I mean, they have proved, been proven effective if they are given at the time you start to develop the complications. Um, also, the way you ventilate patients now has become much more effective than the beginning and help with high flow of oxygen to avoid the intubation. And we hope that during the autumn or early um, January, we will get some new drugs based on interferon, maybe, anticytokines, monoclonal antibodies, we don't know yet. And vaccines, vaccines which would be the safest way to reach herd immunity without going through the complications of disease and the death. The vaccines currently, there are six which are in phase three trials, uh, which means that they are currently uh, tried against placebo to see if they protect against the infection. We hope that by 2021, we will have safe vaccines, that's a priority, and partially effective. If they are more than 50% effective, it's good beginning. And that is the only way to reach herd immunity. We cannot allow the virus to circulate freely. That is too costly in human lives. And if you confine, move to a lockdown, it's too costly for the economics. But if you can wait for the drugs to prevent the complications and the vaccines to reach herd immunity through vaccines, then we eventually would have finally uh, got control of that terrible virus. Thank you very much for your attention. We have 15 minutes, and first of all, I would like to thank the speakers. I myself was very much interested by your three talks. So we have uh, some questions from the audience. I will start with them, and then I will switch, if we have time, with questions, uh, different questions. First of all, uh, please answer quickly so that we have time for each speaker to give the answer. The first question is for you, Rafael, Rafael Duarte. Uh, one of our colleagues in the audience is interested in knowing when do you start doing a chemotherapy course or maybe a transplant in the patients who got the COVID and recovered. Suppose you have, for instance, a lymphoma patient who received two courses of chemo and then you are to go to the third course, but unfortunately, in between, he gets COVID and then he recovers. How long do you wait after recovery before giving the third course, for instance? Yeah, absolutely. That, that, is, a, that is a very relevant uh, question because that's what we've been facing in many of our patients. The reality is that we don't have strong evidence to base a formal uh, time course, and what we all ought to do is just adapt that to the type of patient and the severity and aggressiveness of the disease. Professor Goran before mentioned, for instance, the issue of autologous transplantation in myeloma, courses of chemotherapy, procedures that can be safely delayed, will delay it for, for a period of time. And initially within the Spanish group recommendations went up to, to three months. And then we've seen similar things in other, in other groups. Right now, the reality is that patients that have a, a, a fairly uh, easy course and that clear the uh, COVID with no other issues, we've learned as well that all the potential problems about subsequent fibrosis, pulmonary fibrosis, and other, and other issues, we are less concerned about now that we were back in March. So we tend to be more proactive. In most cases, acute leukemias, we tend to be fairly proactive, and all the types of diseases that are even more chronic, we give some more, more time. Not very, not very precise okay. response, not very precise answer, but I think that, that the learning curve over the period is that we don't need to be too scared to carry on with, with treatment in, in these patients, in particular those that are, have acute aggressive diseases and need to get on with their treatments. Of course, clearance of the virus is, is mandatory for, for that. But as you said, remain proactive. So we get yeah, the message. Absolutely. Then I have a, a second question 
for Professor Wang He. Yeah. Uh, some people and myself, in fact, were interested by uh, the patient, the two patients you showed with the x-rays and most of all the CT scans. And you showed us that with the COVID, the densification of the imaging was uh, more important than with CMV. And I, and I understand why you compare CMV and COVID, because we get both in the hematological departments and probably elsewhere. So the question is just a very simple question. Do, did you reach the level of expertise when looking at the CT scan, you can say, well, this patient has COVID 99% of chances, and that person, that patient has CMV. Would you, would you reach this level of expertise? I'm not speaking, of course, of the lab test. So what do you think on imaging? Okay, thank you very much, is a Professor Goring's question. I think for the uh, COVID-19 patients, uh, because it's all the hematological malignant disease, patients always suffer from some infection, the primary infection, especially the virus infection. So uh, I think it is very important to do the screen, the differential diagnosis. So we suggest uh, the screen diagnosis, including the pulmonary CT scan and uh, the COVID-19 antigen, uh, RT-PCR uh, sequencing, uh, genes sequencing, and uh, combined the uh, COVID-19 antibody. So I think uh, the, because the confirmed diagnosis should be performed the uh, gene question, uh, uh, sequencing, and we can see the confirmed diagnosis. But for the depression diagnosis and the screen diagnosis, I think the uh, chest CT scan is very helpful. So in our hospital, we have the fever clinic. If the, such the patients suffer from fever, and the first we will combine the chest CT scan and the uh, gene sequencing and the antibody. And in three hours, we can get the results. Uh, if the patient is uh, suspicious of uh, COVID-19 infection, we will isolate the uh, special room, and uh, maybe we will observe. And we have then we will confirm diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's uh, important we will uh, quarantine and isolation for such a uh, suspicious patient. Okay, thank you. Then I have a question for uh, Professor Arnaud Fontanet. So you you showed. Uh, what happened what happened with the lockdown with the confinement and it's very impressive because you got exactly the same results in all the regions of france so no question it worked but one of the question and in fact i could have asked myself the same question is the following it worked but then in all the countries not only in france the deconfinement or unlocking seems to be either a failure or well it did not work forever so do you have any comment uh, what what should have been uh, let's say uh, uh, a perfect deconfinement in your view well uh, you may ask this question to our chinese colleague because i think that they are in a much better situation than we are um, but the, if I look at Europe and the way it went, uh, when we came out of the lockdown in France at mid-May, we had about 1,500 infections per day. Um, this is manageable. This is where you can do proper screening, tracing, isolation. Unfortunately, um, during the summer, we let it just gradually um, how to say that, uh, degrade, you know, to the point that now in France, um, we are at officially about 10,000 infections per day. I would say more likely 25,000 per day. Unfortunately, it's about the same situation in Spain. And at that level, it's no longer possible to really control the epidemic. Uh, your screening, tracing, isolation strategy become really challenged. 
And um, I'm really concerned about the fact that we will have a very hard time to bring the level down to these few thousands where you can control the epidemic. In, if I look at other countries in Europe, Italy, for instance, Germany, Denmark, they all do much better. And it's very difficult when you look at the different measures. I mean, I think we all take the same measures. If I look at what the Spanish have decided, what the um, uh, uh, people from the UK, Germany, we are more or less all on the same line. Maybe small differences, for instance, the Danish and the Sweden do not use a mask. Um, but other than that, we all have more or less the same policies. And it's really very difficult to understand what makes a difference between countries. My guess, but it's pure speculation, is that in France, we have not acquired the level of self-discipline you need to uh, prevent the transmission, particularly when we are with friends or family. And when I look at the bars and restaurants of Paris um, in the evening, crowded, um, when I hear of friends who tell me uh, I'm going to the wedding of whoever uh, next week where there would be 250 people, I realize that people have not a uh, true conscience of the risk that we are currently taking. And maybe what happens in Italy, Germany, and some other countries is that they have been much more careful at the time we are getting out of the summer, you know, when, um, but, but this is speculation, it's not based on data. And um, just to tell you, I'm really concerned uh, that the current time where we have uh, opening of schools, universities, people going back to work after holidays, uh, soon we will have the time it will get a bit colder and people will be in confined environments. Um, plus the level of circulation of the virus in France, but I'm afraid it's about the same situation in Spain, will make it extremely challenging to control. And the longer we wait for taking the measures, the more difficult it will be to control the epidemic, the stronger the measures will have to be, and the longer in time they will have to be. So I think there is no point for not starting now. And, uh, and we will have a period of three to six months very challenging before, I hope, some of the first active drugs like monoclonal antibodies, for instance, will help on the top of drugs which have proven effective like corticosteroids and anticoagulants. And uh, 2021, we will probably have the first vaccines, partially effective. It's really important they are safe because, as you know, in France, people are not very um, happy with vaccines. So they have to be safe. And gradually, we'll have more and more vaccines that make it a little bit easier. But um, again, to answer directly your question, I'm sorry for this very long answer. Uh, it's, um, it, it's really, uh, I'm afraid that the level of individuals that we have failed, people have been pretty good at wearing the mask, pretty good at washing hands, keeping the physical distance. But when they come into the family level or the friends level, they remove masks, they get closer. And, and that's my guess where things went wrong. But again, I'm not um, really, uh, it's really based on speculation. I'm curious to know what Rafael or Hay thinks. Um, they are very right. different uh, Just along these lines, I'm just receiving a question, uh, which may be a question for the three of you, provided that you answer in one minute, uh, very rapidly. <laughs> I, I won't say anything. <laughs> the question is about would for some reason this second wave, if we call it a second wave, be milder, with milder cases than the first one. In other words, uh, I think this has been the feeling for some time in France that maybe what we are observing now is milder than before. Is it true in Rafael, uh, in Spain, do you have the same feeling? Rafael, yes, no? <laughs> So yes, I think that we still have the feeling that this second wave is somewhat milder the, because we're testing everyone, which is something we didn't do back in March. The, the numbers of, of new cases are very high, as Professor Fontanet was saying, but the percentage of those that go into hospital, into ICU, are far lower. And also is going 
slower, slower in time. It's not just in two, three weeks we have a huge peak. So we'll have to see how this develops. But hopefully, fingers crossed, it'll be less aggressive from a clinical perspective. It's hard to tell how much masks make the inoculum smaller and therefore less severe. There's many other hypotheses that are hard to tell, but hopefully it'll stay like that. This is my perspective here as well. Thank you, Rafael. Professor Wang He, do you have the same feeling? I mean, suppose, well, we think that there is no more case of COVID in China. Uh, is that true? And if you still see some of them, are they milder? Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, and uh, China, uh, no new cases and uh, about the uh, uh, about the uh, four four months. And uh, recently, and every month, we will detect uh, the, such the incidence of the new case. And the majority of the new cases is uh, import from the foreign countries and here. And uh, and there is a very small cast incidence, and in China such the if the such the situation uh, situation and we will close the lockdown the city, and uh, now uh, until now and uh, the safe and uh, the majority of people said uh, can uh, move free and uh, can the uh, active free, uh, but we will uh, caution that uh, maybe the second wave, and uh, maybe the autumn or the winter spring. And maybe the return here and the uh, second wave again. So now we will have the, the strict the, um, the, the measure measures for the protect. And just like the wear the mask and the isolation and the social distance, and we will also brought down. Yeah. So we will finish with Professor Fontanet. Is it, do you have the same feeling in France or are you more anxious? I'm more anxious. I'm more anxious because if you analyze the age of people who get infected and you know the level of severity is very much depending on age, you can reproduce the hospitalization curve um, just because the population that got infected during the summer was younger. However, now the virus has spread to older generations and now we are starting the rise of hospitalization and intensive care units in France. And I'm afraid that it will become very tough in two to four weeks. As you have seen, Marseille and Bordeaux, two cities in the southern part of France, had their intensive care units already overwhelmed by patients. And that will continue in other cities of France. Um, so uh, it's just a matter of age distribution of the infections, unfortunately. And as Raphael was mentioning, it's not going as fast as in last March. The doubling time of cases in last March was three and a half days. Now it is two weeks, but two weeks it goes extremely fast. And um, currently we have 25,000 cases in France. Two weeks from now, 50,000. Four weeks from now, 100,000 if nothing is done. So I can only again urge to take very strong measures very soon. Okay, so uh, we will finish now. So let me thank you again. Uh, thank also Air in Space who uh, support uh, this uh, seminar and uh, thank the audience. So bye bye everyone and thank you for participating.